Good morning. My name is Melissa, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to, the, to discuss Go Forward plan for Antares rocket and cargo deliveries for NASA. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question at this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. David Thompson. You may begin your conference. Okay. Uh, thank you, Melissa, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to discuss uh, Orbital's Go Forward plans following last week's Centauri's launch failure. Uh, I'm Dave Thompson, and, and with me is uh, Garrett Pierce. We have some encouraging information to talk about this morning. Uh, before we begin, however, I would like to ask everyone to be aware that some of the comments that we will make uh, during the call uh, are going to be forward-looking statements. Uh, these statements are subject to various risk and uncertainties that, that may cause actual operational or financial results to differ materially from what we currently expect them to be. Additional information concerning uh, the major factors that could cause actual results to differ is contained in this morning's press release uh, and in our reports uh, previously filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'd like to start off by giving you a brief update on what we know about the launch failure that took place uh, last week. Our accident investigation has only been underway uh, for the past uh, six days, so substantial work is still ahead to conclusively determine the cause of the failure. To date, a very rich set of telemetry and video data has been initially analyzed, and a large amount of debris uh, from Antares and Cygnus uh, uh, has been collected and examined. While still preliminary and subject to change, current evidence strongly suggests that one of the two AJ-26 main engines that powered Antares' first stage failed about 15 seconds after ignition. At this time, we believe the failure likely originated in or directly affected the turbopump machinery of this engine, but I want to stress that more analysis will be required to confirm that this finding is correct. As previously reported, we are very fortunate that no one was injured and that the Wallops Island launch complex sustained relatively limited damage. In addition, we can say that all safety systems and procedures functioned as designed. Preliminary estimates of the schedule and cost to affect necessary launch complex repairs are still being prepared. At this point, I believe the numbers will be a small fraction of the initial investment made to bring the uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport facility at Wallops Island uh, online a few years ago. And to the extent that any orbital-owned equipment was damaged, its repair or replacement cost will be covered by insurance. With that background, I now want to look forward. Over the past week, Orbital has updated and expanded previously developed contingency plans and product improvement roadmaps to create a comprehensive go-forward approach. This go-forward plan will enable the company to fulfill our commitments to NASA, under the current CRS Space Station Cargo Program, and also to return Antares to flight status as soon as possible. I want to caution that at present these plans are still under review and as a result uh, could be subject to future revision. And while we have discussed these plans with NASA and other relevant parties at a conceptual level, many details still need to be worked out before the plans can be finalized. With those qualifications in mind, uh, here is what we intend to do. First, Orbital will employ the inherent flexibility of our Cygnus cargo spacecraft that permits it to be launched on third-party launch vehicles and to accommodate heavier cargo loads as allowed by more capable launchers. This option had already been contemplated in previous contingency plans 
and product improvement up, uh, uh, roadmaps uh, and its implementation should be relatively straightforward. Second, taking advantage of the spacecraft's flexibility, we will purchase one or two non-Antares launch vehicles for Cygnus flights in 2015 and possibly in early 2016 and combine them with several upgraded Antares rocket launches of additional Cygnus spacecraft in 2016 to deliver all remaining CR CRS cargo. That is, by consolidating the cargo of five previously planned CRS missions into four more capable ones, we believe we can maintain a similar or perhaps even a somewhat better delivery schedule than we were on before last week's launch failure, uh, completing all current CRS program cargo deliveries by the end of 2016. Third, we will accelerate the introduction of Antares' upgraded propulsion system, advancing its initial launch date from the previously planned 2017 into 2016. Consequently, we will likely discontinue the use of the AJ-26 rocket engines that have been used on the first five Antares vehicles unless and until those engines can be conclusively shown to be flight worthy. Finally, we will support the work of Mars and NASA to quickly repair the, the facility damage at Wallops Island so as to allow Antares launch operations to resume there in early to mid-2016 and to continue for the long term. We will accomplish these actions with no cost increases to NASA under our CRS contract and, uh, as I noted earlier, with modest, if any, near-term delays to our space station cargo delivery schedules. In key respects, this plan follows the same upgrade path we were previously pursuing to increase the performance and reliability of Antares and to expand the capacity of Cygnus. Now, however, we will uh, be able to make faster progress due to our ability to redirect both manpower and hardware from the original Antares configuration to the new uh, vehicle configuration. From a financial standpoint, the impacts to orbital are not expected to be material on an annual basis in 2015, although the exact magnitude and timing of quarterly changes will depend on which of several specific variations on the overall plan we settle on. And in any event, I do not expect any significant adverse financial impacts in 2016 or in future years. Please note that this assessment is based on our plans and analyses as they currently stand and could be subject to revision in the future. In conclusion, Orbital is taking decisive action to support NASA in the safe and productive operations of the space station and to aggressively move forward to put both our CRS cargo program and our Antares launch vehicle back on track. We believe these actions will continue to build value for NASA and our other customers as well as for our shareholders. Finally, I want to say how very much we appreciate the tremendous support Orbital has received from NASA uh, and Virginia's uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport uh, commercial team over the last seven years on, on our Antares rocket and Cygnus cargo spacecraft programs. We look forward to working closely with them to quickly recover from last week's setback. Garrett and I would now be happy to respond to a few questions. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from the line of Michael Charmoli with KeyBank Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for uh, taking the questions. Um, yes, good Dave, morning, Mike. Dave, can you actually tell us what the um, what the engine solution is going to be? I know there's there's some whispers out there among you know NASA sites that it, it's going to be a uh, Russian-made RD-193 engine. Uh, can you comment on on what your plan is or, or what engine solution you're going with? 
Um, Mike, I can, but I won't, um, for the reasons that um, we um, previously indicated, uh, specifically because uh, Antares continues to be in contention for a number of new launch contracts. I would prefer to uh, uh, wait uh, a bit before uh, being specific about the uh, approach that we've chosen uh, for the new Antares main propulsion system. Okay, okay, that's fair. And then um, just getting into you know the financial impact. If you do in fact discontinue the the AJ twenty sixes. You know, can you walk us through, you know, maybe the contract mechanics there? I mean, do you have to take a write down of those engines? Can you, you know, is, is uh, you know, Aerojet Gen Corp on the hook for those engines? You know, just kind of give us how this is, because I mean, I'm assuming, you know, you guys are still under contract, but if there is material fault within these engines, you know, it probably rests on Gen Corp and, and not you guys. Maybe can you just walk us through how the, that dynamic might work? Uh, on that one, Mike, as well, I think uh, it's it's a, a bit premature to uh, comment on any uh, details. Uh, uh, I'll just uh, refer back to what I said uh, earlier as to the uh, overall uh, financial impacts to Orbital, which, again, we do not expect uh, to be material on an annual basis uh, next year. There could, there could be some variations from quarter to quarter. Uh, as to how um, things work out. And again, I'd stress that we do not see any significant adverse uh, financial impacts to the company in 2016 or, or beyond that point. Okay, okay. And then maybe just, I guess, the, the last one. You know, looking at another launcher, it would seem that, you know, maybe the Falcon 9, you know, with a, a stated price of $61 million, is that one of the only cost-effective launchers out there? I mean, when you look at the total encumbered costs for, for a Delta or an Atlas, it would seem that that would, you know, be a material increase than the, than the current cost of your Antares launcher. I mean, is that really the only option out there, or, or are there other launchers, you know, from Soyuz rockets that, that we should be thinking of? We are in discussions now with three uh, launch providers Two, of, two based in the U.S. and one uh, based in Europe. Indications at this point are favorable that uh, uh, these launch operators do have uh, available capacity that is suitable for Cygnus launches as early as the second quarter of 2015 and extending all the way through mid to late 2016. Uh, there are uh, variations among the operators in terms of their specific uh, uh, schedule um, availability and the, uh, uh, perform the, the uh, payload performance and pricing of their vehicles. Um, at this point, uh, we are considering, uh, uh, we started with uh, uh, reviewing, I would say, about 15 discrete combinations of things and have reduced those to five or six that look most promising. We believe all of the, uh, the most favorable scenarios uh, uh, not only accomplish our principal objectives uh, with respect to meeting our commitments under the CRS program, but also generally limit the financial impacts to the company uh, along the lines I've outlined. We expect to work with NASA to determine the most favorable combination for one or two uh, gap filler missions using third-party launch vehicles and are aiming to make uh, final decisions on the best way forward uh, over the course of the coming month. Got it. Um, thanks, guys. I'll jump back in the queue. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Your next question comes from the line of Howard Rubel with Jeffries. Your line is open. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the speed in which you've come back to us, um, Dave, m must give you some confidence that um, the solutions are quite far along. Um, could you just uh, talk for a minute about how you've uh, thought about that? Um, we've got a, um, uh, as, as I indicated earlier, Howard, we, we have uh, maintained a a contingency plan um, almost since the outset of the, the CRS program uh, to anticipate what we might do 
uh, either if there were extended uh, delays in introducing the Antares rocket or, um, or if we were um, grounded for a period of time due to a launch uh, failure. Um, and those plans uh, uh, have, uh, have uh, been updated periodically and, and now are, uh, are being um, um, expanded uh, to take into account the uh, particular circumstances that we, we face. Um, I would say in this case that um, uh, while, it, while it may appear that uh, there's Im some improvisation involved that uh, one person's uh, Improvisation is another's contingency planning, and I think what we're doing here is, is uh, while it contains a bit of both, is is really founded on uh, contingency planning that we've had uh, uh, from the beginning. It's I'm, fairly. I'm, it, yeah, I'm just going to say it's fairly rapid and decisive, and I mean I think that's pretty pretty impressive given the magnitude of the failure. Um, but I do kind of want to step back for a second and and now you're going to use somebody else's rocket what what does that say though about the competitive position of Antares longer term because you're showing a potential competitor a pathway to compete um, for further NASA cargo opportunities I don't believe it's a, a disadvantage uh, to our uh, competitive position in any respect. If anything, Howard, I think by, um, uh, by responding decisively and using the flexibility that the Cygnus uh, cargo spacecraft has that uh, will uh, demonstrate uh, the, uh, the uh, dependability of Orbital as a supplier that's committed to doing everything uh, possible to meet our commitments to customers and the flexibility of our systems to, uh, to accommodate uh, unexpected uh, uh, development. So I'm not, uh, not at all worried about that. And then finally, um, I'm impressed a little bit that either you've had contingency or that you've had um, you know, uh, enough management reserves so that this doesn't require um, a, a material, um, I'll call it disruption to your uh, business plans. Could, does that say something about the progress you were starting to make in building Antares and, and Cygnus? And maybe there was a learning curve or, or something there that's given you this flexibility? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't focus in that area at, at this point. I would highlight that um, uh, under this uh, appro the approach I've outlined, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we will be uh, we will be carrying out what had been planned over five missions with just four missions, and so certain costs will go up, but other costs, as a result, will go down. In addition, uh, uh, we will, with uh, the uh, taking advantage of the Cygnus flexibility. Uh, we will be able to carry on each of those four missions uh, um, sufficient uh, increase in cargo capacity that uh, by the end of 2016 we'll, uh, uh, we will have, we will have uh, delivered the uh, full uh, amount that uh, had been planned to be uh, delivered under five missions. And so, there will be some areas of uh, cost that go up, others that uh, uh, go down, um, and uh, uh, we do not, uh, in implementing this plan, in anticipate uh, any uh, significant uh, use of remaining management reserve that will continue to be available uh, for the future uh, if it's needed to offset uh, unexpected cost or uh, potentially to improve long-term profitability. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Patrick McCarthy with FBR Capital. Your line is open. Uh, good morning, guys. Thanks uh, for taking my question. Uh, my question is, is on the cash flow dynamics of going from the five missions to the four um, and whether there is an impact. And, and, and I guess the, the real question is whether the cash flow that you receive from NASA is based on the number of launches that you're doing or the tons of cargo that you're delivering uh, to the space station. 
Uh, yes, good morning, Patrick. It's uh, primarily the latter, the uh, amount of cargo delivered to the space station. Okay, thanks. And then, and then on the engine decision that you've made, um, is there any way you could maybe just talk about a couple of the major factors um, that, that are built into your decision? Uh, obviously, you're not going to give us what engine it is, but um, just maybe one or two of the things that you were looking for in this engine relative to uh, the AJ-26s. Thank you. Um, I think first and foremost uh, would be uh, reliability, um, uh, followed by um, a, uh, a balance of uh, increased performance and, uh, and reasonable uh, cost. Your next question comes from the line of Gary Leibowitz with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Uh, thanks, operator. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, Hi, Dave, is it fair to conclude from your from your comments today that your your confidence in, in closing the the merger with ATK is still where it was a week ago, and you know you'd expect uh, you know the timing that you had originally contemplated to still be um, a realistic scenario. Um, Gary, I'm going to stay focused today uh, just on the go forward plan for. Of the CRS program and Antares, uh, rather than uh, the merger. Um, uh, so, rather than getting into that topic, let me just say for now that that I don't have anything to add to what was said uh, uh, when we talked uh, on on that uh, topic last week. Okay, that's fair enough. And if I can ask, you know, you mentioned that you're likely to discontinue the AJ26 engine. Um, I guess it's, it's it's fair to conclude that. The, the what you think caused the problem is not something that would have been detected during testing, but is a fundamental reliability issue with the engine. Um, I would say that's uh, a good. A, I would say that's a good assessment. Thank you. Yes. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Quilty with Raymond James. Your line is open. Uh, thanks, David. Just to follow up on the Cygnus upgrade, is that an, you already had an upgrade path for the Cygnus to increase capacity. Are you going to double increase, or was this all in line with the prior plans? Uh, Chris, good morning. Uh, good question. This is all in line with the prior plans. The, uh, the next uh, Cygnus, uh, which is uh, spacecraft number five, uh, has already implemented the uh, the, up, the performance upgrades. Uh, it was it uh, had previously been limited to carrying uh, between 26 and 2700 kilograms due to the capacity of the original Antares launch vehicle. Looking forward, with both third-party uh, launch vehicles and with the upgraded propulsion system on Antares. The Cygnus uh, capacity will expand on average to about 3,300 kilograms. It will vary a little bit uh, up or down by a few hundred kilograms from that amount, depending on the specific launch vehicle we use. But uh, but the basic uh, uh, enhanced Cygnus that uh, uh, was already planned to come online next year is the is the same one we plan to use now. It will just uh, be able to carry slightly heavier cargo loads because the uh, launch vehicles will be more capable of, uh, of uh, uh, in terms of their uh, payload capacity. Gotcha. And uh, second question, I know Ariane Space was having some problems filling the lower position of the uh, uh, their rocket and uh, did some discounting to, uh, to try to fill up those dual payloads. I just wanted to confirm, could, could Cygnus sit in the lower position of an Ariane 5? Um, uh, Chris, it, it, the answer is physically yes, it could fit, but that's not, uh, it, it, generally speaking, that's not uh, one of the options we're looking at because uh, in pairing up uh, two satellites on an Ariane 5, those are going to typically, the, the primary satellite's going to a different orbit which is not compatible with the orbit uh, that Cygnus uh, uh, would, uh, would be placed in. So, um, so that particular approach is not one that uh, we're examining at this time. 
So no science missions on the manifest that would uh, pair up well. We're looking at a number of possibilities, uh, but not uh, not the earlier one that you alluded to. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. I think at this point uh, we will wrap up for for uh, the day. Uh, thanks again to everyone for joining us uh, this morning uh, for Aspera at Astra. Good day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. For the past week, Orbital has updated and expanded previously developed contingency plans and product improvement roadmaps to create a comprehensive go-forward approach. This go-forward plan will enable the company to fulfill our commitments to NASA under the current CRS Space Station Cargo Program and also to return Antares to flight status as soon as possible. I want to caution that at present these plans are still under review and as a result uh, could be subject to future revision. And while we have discussed these plans with NASA and other relevant parties at a conceptual level, many details still need to be worked out before the plans can be finalized. With those qualifications in mind, uh, here is what we intend to do. Good morning, my name is Melissa and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to, the dis to discuss Go Forward plan for Interis rocket and cargo deliveries for NASA. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question at this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. David Thompson. You may begin your conference. Okay. Uh, thank you, Melissa, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to discuss uh, Orbital's Go Forward plans following last week's Centauri's launch failure. Uh, I'm Dave Thompson, and, and with me is uh, Garrett Pierce. We have some encouraging information to talk about uh, six days, so substantial work is still ahead to conclusively determine the cause of the failure. To date, a very rich set of telemetry and video data has been initially analyzed, and a large amount of debris uh, from Antares and Cygnus uh, uh, has been collected and examined. While still preliminary and subject to change, current evidence strongly suggests that one of the two AJ-26 main engines that powered Antares first stage failed about 15 seconds after ignition. At this time, we believe the failure likely originated in or directly affected the turbopump machinery of this engine, but I want to stress that more analysis will be required to confirm that this finding is correct. About this morning. Uh, before we begin, however, I would like to ask everyone to be aware that some of the comments that we will make uh, during the call uh, are going to be forward-looking statements. Uh, these statements are subject to various risk and uncertainties that, that may cause actual operational or financial results to differ materially from what we currently expect them to be. Additional information concerning uh, the major factors that could cause actual results to differ is contained in this morning's press release uh, and in our reports uh, previously filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'd like to start off by giving you a brief update on what we know about the launch failure that took place uh, last week. Our accident investigation has only been underway uh, for the past as previously reported, we are very fortunate that no one was injured and that the Wallops Island launch complex sustained relatively limited damage. In addition, we can say that all safety systems and procedures functioned as designed. Preliminary estimates of the schedule and cost to affect necessary launch complex repairs are still being prepared. At this point, I believe the numbers will be a small fraction of the initial investment made to bring the uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport Facility at Wallops Island uh, online 
a few years ago. And to the extent that any orbital-owned equipment was damaged, its repair or replacement cost will be covered by insurance. With that background, I now want to look forward. 